Hello everyone and welcome to the talk Work Won't Love You Back, uh, which is facilitated through the Gendered Organizational Practice Research Cluster at the Open University, GOP for short. My name is Nella Smolovich jones I am the Director of GOP and I will be your host today. For those of you unfamiliar with this research cluster, I should say that GOP provides a space in which all those dedicated to gender equality can share insights from academic study and practice. Now, before I introduce our amazing speaker, some very, very light, light uh, housekeeping. Um, on your right hand side, you will see a Q&A pane, and this is where you can type in your questions for Sarah and make sure to also take advantage of the like button. This is how you can vote for those questions that you particularly like, and uh, I will make sure to give those questions priority in the Q&A. Now, um, most of you are probably uh, very much accustomed to events like this, but please note that this session is being recorded so we can share it on our website for those who could not join us. Now on to a treat. Our amazing speaker today is Sarah Jaffe, an insightful journalist whose writing on labour has engaged the readership of the New York Times, The Guardian, The Nation and the numerous other media outlets. However, and Fortunately, for those of us who enjoy reading and thinking about nature work, Sarah has recently decided to amalgamate her talent for writing, her methodical approach to research and her stubborn dedication to justice and equality into the book Necessary Trouble and the book we are going to discuss uh, today called Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted and Alone. Now, this book could not be more timely, and not only because we are approaching International Workers' Day, um, like uh, the invitation said, but because the pandemic seems to have brought work to the center of everyone's attention. For those fortunate to have jobs, the pandemic has intensified, intensified work, both productive and reproductive. Of course, for those uh, out of work, it has been even worse. And on the other hand, the pandemic seems to have um, acted as, as a kind of cover for some organizations to use tech to surveil and monitor people working at home, in many ways following uh, practices already developed in warehouses, call centers, supermarkets. Other organizations have used the pandemic to erode people's pay and, and conditions. So a rational person um, might wonder then uh, why under these kinds of circumstances we are increasingly being asked to love our jobs or to be passionate about them. And moreover, why so many of us fall into this lure of searching for love through work? To, today we are going to hear more about this question and Sarah explores the nature of work in our contemporary world and our relationship uh, with it. Sarah is not only a talented writer, as I said, but also a poster child for work in the contemporary economy, as she refers to herself in her book. And I'm sure many uh, will be able to relate to that. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Sarah. Uh, enjoy the talk and see you in the Q&A. Sarah, over to you. Hi, thanks um, for having me, everyone. It's good to be here. I feel very weird all the time giving these talks. I'm sort of like, hello, I assume there are people out there. I'm going to just act as though you exist. Um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I feel very seen. <laughs> I am, as she was saying, a labor journalist, which was a dying field of focus in the media not too long ago and then lately in the last year especially i've been joking a lot that everyone is a labor journalist now partly because of the pandemic and then of course something we will get to later there's been a ton of interest in the u.s on in labor because of the uh, union drive that just concluded unsuccessfully at the Amazon facility in Bessemer Alabama so it's been a wild time for labor journalism um, and I wrote this book in part because it is, as, uh, as Nela was saying, my life, but also because I'd been covering work for over a decade and 
listening to the stories from everyone from TV producers to fast food workers was hearing sort of over and over and over again the same story of people's you know, managers, bosses, whatever, expecting them to not only show up to work on time and do the job and do a good job, but also to be grateful for it and to love it and to be really committed to it and go above and beyond and all of these things, because like if everyone goes above and beyond, how, what even is anyway? Um, not that long ago, a friend of mine forwarded me a story from, I believe the St. Petersburg Times of Florida, local newspaper from 1981 about workaholism. And in this article, that was a bad thing. And it was discussing the rare people who work to live, yeah, who, right, live to work rather than work to live. And now, of course, it just sounds like every single job application, right? Um, I was driving through New Jersey yesterday and once again passed my least favorite billboard, which is the, um, the Amazon warehouse job billboard once again saying get a job delivering smiles and I kind of flip it off as I go past but um so I finished writing this book last February I was actually in London and I flew back to the US in early March and basically straight into lockdown so um by the time I got my edits back from my beloved editor Katie O'Donnell we were in a different world but we also didn't change that much about the book. I went back and I interviewed um, my main subjects. Each chapter is focused on the story of one worker that I spent some time with in depth. So I went back and sort of had a, a call with all of them to see how their work had changed. But the overarching argument of the book did not change at all. Um, and I like to think that I'm prescient, but also it just is so obvious that every trend in the workplace in the last few decades is that everything is getting worse. So everything is getting worse at the same time as we're expected to be happier and happier about it, um, project more and more love and excitement for it. And that sort of common sense of the neoliberal era is what I'm writing about in this book. The way that loving your job is a motivating tool to get us to commit more fully to work, even as working conditions are getting worse. For most people, inequality is growing and the process of production requires fewer people, even as of course capitalism still requires that we work in order to get money, in order to get food, housing, all of the things that we need to live. Um, so the labor of love discourse runs through all of these different kinds of work from that Amazon warehouse ad. Um, it's a made company that was advertising for passionate people to scrub floors. Um, but it is especially common in certain sectors. And so I structured the book around 10 different sectors of work and the story of how this discourse of loving your job spread from those sectors across the broader economy from places like caring work creative work the tech sector even sports um i also wrote this book because we are at a moment where the sort of popular understanding of the working class has not kept up with the reality of what work looks like in 2021 What's actually been happening is that a lot of people who might have assumed we were safely middle class are starting to understand that our relationship to power in the workplace means we are still workers and beginning to organize like workers. And on the other hand, workers who have sort of long been considered um, too lumpen, too unserious, too unskilled to organize from fast food workers to gig economy workers wind up sort of at the face of the labor movement doing the most exciting, most innovative organizing. So the working class does not look anymore the way it looked 50 years ago. It is not actually represented by a white guy in a flat cap or a baseball cap hard hat basically on the job anymore. Um, there are still, of course, plenty of white men in the working class, but it's a much broader and more complicated picture. 
It's also one, of course, that's shaped by the world outside the workplace, where most major cities have a housing crisis, education, and in the US anyway, healthcare are more costly. And in the UK, the you know, NHS is always being privatized and chipped away at in a variety of ways. Where policing is harsher, this is obviously really fresh on my mind because last night the Minneapolis police killed yet another young man in the midst of a trial of a police officer for killing George Floyd. And of course, I've been watching the protests around the policing bill in the UK, which um, I have plenty of thoughts about how this relates to the workplace, if you want to ask me those questions in a little bit. Um, and of course, migration and borders are an ever present concern of our politics and only made more so again because of the pandemic. Um, we are looking at a world where technology allows bosses to slice and dice schedules, to demand that office staffers work from home at all hours. Um, as Nela was saying, the same technology that is used to surveil Amazon workers is also being used to surveil um, those of us who are in semi white collar work or white collar work doing it from home. And to supervise, of course, app based workers in the gig economy from a distance to squeeze more work out of them. And all of this awful stuff is happening at the same time once again as we're expected to find our jobs exciting and fulfilling and joyful and meaningful and all of that stuff. So we've gotten here because of changes in the actual economy, right? So the economic and political crisis of the 1970s begin the process of deindustrialization in places like the US and the UK. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, my favorite Fed Chair Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan, of course, step on the accelerator, deindustrializing very intensely and breaking unions very much on purpose, right? So production gets shut down in places like the US and the UK. It's an ongoing process and shipped elsewhere or automated. We also have, you know, within the US sort of internal outsourcing where you know you move you move plants from states that have high union density down to the south. Um, this is why it's such a big deal. Um, again, I, I, I'm sure we'll end up talking about Amazon and Bessemer a lot, but these big organizing campaigns in the US South have a particular resonance because that is a really unorganized part of the country. Um, and as this process is happening, workers who are used to being able to go on strike to halt production to win their demands, are suddenly in a position of calling for their plants to be kept open. How do you go on strike? to save your job when the boss wants to close down the workplace. It's a big problem that we'll return to. Um, so my friend Joshua Clover in his book Riot Strike Riot calls this the affirmation trap where labor is locked into the position of affirming its own exploitation under the guise of survival. So you can see how we go in part from the affirmation trap to the labor of love. Suddenly we have to beg for our jobs. We have to act like we want to keep them rather than, you know, finding them rather annoying things that allow us to pay the bills. Also, what happens, um, and my friend Gabe Wynett has a wonderful book that's just out called The Next Shift that details in particular how this shift happens in Pittsburgh, which used to be a factory town and now the largest employer is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. The jobs that replace the factory jobs are retail, healthcare, services, and technology. Um, we hear a lot about the knowledge economy and how everybody should learn to code when they get laid off, but actually what happens is you're far more likely to be in some sort of feminized service work. These jobs, of course, have their own affirmation trap that they've had for a very long time, which is you have to smile and there's ever increasing exciting technology to make sure you're smiling. So with industrial jobs waning and industrial jobs where you don't have to smile at the car as it goes past you on the assembly line, more and more of us end up in jobs that require some version of the labor of love. Fields that are growing the fastest are things like nursing, with you know, your famous 1% NHS nursing pay rise, um, food service, home health care, gender jobs where workers are expected to care for other people. These are service positions that draw on skills that are presumed to come naturally to women. They're seen as extensions of the caring work that we are expected to be naturally good at and doing already for free in the home. So high also on the job growth list are, of course, computer programmers. Again, that endless learn to code. 
who might earn higher salaries, but are also expected to demonstrate passion for their work. Silicon Valley's sort of whole ideology is about how cool the job is. And that devotion is often shown through really, really ridiculously long hours. So their work is narrativized in, in the sort of same way that creative labor is, right? Rooted in our old notions of artistic work. So Luke Boltansky and Eve Cappello in The New Spirit of Capitalism argue that part of the reason we also got this shift in the structures of capitalism was response to the social movements of the 60s and 70s. They identified two critiques, which are the artistic critique, challenging the boring conformity and misery of sort of having the same job for your entire life, whether it be on the assembly line or in the sort of proverbial gray flannel suit, and the social critique, which is the one I've kind of been making at you for the last 10 minutes, uh, which is fo focused on this fundamental inequality of capitalist life, the way some people have their needs catered to, um, and many, many other people are facing what geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment. So 60s and 70s, you get demands for workers control and resistance to the very idea of assembly line work in places like the Fiat factories in Italy, in the GM factory in Lordstown, Ohio. And you also get, of course, the rise of feminism and the rebellion against the suburban home and the, you know, man goes to work, woman stays home and cooks and cleans lifestyle. And what ends up happening in all of this mishmash um, is that the nature of work in these countries where we all live, hope, I mean, I assume, I don't know if we have some other people on this uh, call from elsewhere who want to talk about where the factory work is being done and by whom, but the nature of work changes results in employers seeking out these very sort of human traits that assembly line work was supposed to strip away, was trying to strip away. So creativity, people skills, caring are what employers are seeking to exploit in the jobs we're supposed to love. And we are supposed to believe that exercising them is making work less miserable, but instead what's happened is it has helped it work, it's helped work to worm its way deeper into every facet of our lives. So, um, I split the book up into two halves. The first half is drawing on caring work, starting with women's unpaid work in the home, moving through paid domestic labor, teaching, retail work, and the nonprofit or charity sector. The second half book, roughly around creative work, starting with artists, unpaid internships, um, academia, the tech sector, and finally ending with sports because I had to end with sports. And so in a couple of, so yeah, a couple of examples, I'm obsessively talking about teachers these days because teachers have faced no end of garbage during the pandemic, right? The, the tendency to blame teachers for everything that possibly goes wrong has only been amplified, right? It's teacher's fault that the virus is out of control and therefore it's not safe to be in school. It's teachers' fault apparently when the virus is spreading and therefore you reopen the schools and everybody's getting sick again. Um, the story of teachers is of a gendered occupation where it's considered similar to the work of mothers and therefore something that people are inherently called to. Again, that so much of it is not really perceived as skilled so much as showing up to care about the kids and the criticisms of teaching when people want to believe it's being done badly are often along the lines of caring and certainly when teachers make any demands for themselves the refrain is always don't you care about the kids don't if you cared about the kids enough you would not complain about being marched back into the classroom yeah. to die of covid and <laughs> you would just sacrifice yourself for the kids um, the retail sector, people probably think a little bit less about workers having a natural calling to work at Tesco or whatever, but at the same time, you are still expected to present a smile always, no matter what happens to you. Anne-Marie Reinhardt, the worker that I profile in my retail chapter, has stories of she worked at Toys R Us 
She has stories of a woman throwing her daughter's wet panties at an employee because she did not like what the employee said to her. And Anne Marie had a scar on her forehead from a customer who threw a toy at her face. Yeah, I saw it. I didn't see the toy being thrown, but the scar on her face. Um, and Anne Marie actually passed away of COVID-19 because another reality of retail work is that this is the essential work that people are being required to go in and do in person when a lot of us are able to work from home. So continuing from there, um, since I'm talking at the Open University, I have to mention academia, which has been, of course, casualized increasingly. I mean, Margaret Thatcher just did away with tenure entirely in the UK. In the US, it's been slowly chipped away at so that now something like 70 to 73 percent of university classes are being taught by some kind of contingent faculty, adjuncts, grad students, others, non-tenure track faculty. And all of that contingency means you're getting paid less and less to do the thing that a lot of people went into academia to do, which is the research and instead only being paid for the time that people spend literally in the classroom and the destruction of the university as a place that is supposed to be about research and the life of the mind and now is about giving people credentials so that they can go get good jobs perhaps jobs that they will love um so i'm sure plenty of people here have a lot of thoughts about what's been going on in academia we could talk about that more if you'd like and uh, then I wanted to wrap this little bit up with the games industry, video games developers who um, work so much that there is an industry in term for excessive overtime, it's called crunch. So you are expected to work however many hours is necessary. There are stories of um, programmers on the game Red Dead Redemption working 100 hour weeks in the you know weeks before the game was put out. Um, it's ridiculous, right? But it's games. Games are fun and cool and exciting and you get to play all day, right? No, you're sitting in front of a computer coding all day. It's exhausting, just like any other work you would be doing all day staring at a computer is. Um, and so um, I actually ended up giving this talk because I met Jamie Woodcock while I was talking to the Games Workers United um, branch of the IWGB and Jamie introduced me to Nila and here I am. So that's uh, also a fun connection there. And um, so what do we do about all of this, right? This is the question that everybody has asked me because people are really sad that my book is not an advice book. I am sorry, I am in no way equipped to give advice, but each of the stories, each of the workers that I profile in each of these chapters is somebody who's been organizing around their work. They are people who came to realization that their job did not in fact love them back in a variety of ways, right? There is everything from Anne Marie, who I mentioned, who got very, very angry when Toys R Us was suddenly being closed and the workers were getting no severance pay, no support after she'd worked there 30 years. So she was very involved in organizing to bring severance pay out of the dying corporation, change the law so that workers who are laid off suddenly in a bankruptcy do not come last in the bankruptcy courts. Um, I talked about the games workers who have unionized, um, teachers. I was in Los Angeles for the big strike in Los Angeles among the teachers there and profiled one of the teachers who was really involved in organizing on that level and with her students. And um, who else? There's everybody. Um, I profiled an adjunct professor at, well, actually she teaches at several universities in the New York area because that's what you do when you're an adjunct professor and was involved in one of the leaders of the adjunct union victory at Fordham University. Um, and yeah, and I think I'll close by just saying that the pandemic is a nightmare from start to finish, but it has given us a moment of massive public conversation about work. So the governments have in at least some way in both of our countries paid people to stay home, whether they did that through in the US expanded unemployment benefits or the furlough scheme in the UK. We've talked about basic income. We've both seen that the governments can in fact just send us money, although I'm still waiting on my latest check. Um, Joe Biden, get it together. And the conversation around essential workers, essential work is 
giving us another language, another moment to talk about what work is essential, how essential is any work, and what we might do to arrange all of this differently and, you know, couldn't happen sooner because we're facing a massive looming climate crisis that is deeply, um, you know, implicates every part of the way we live right now, but particularly the ways we work and produce. And so I will stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, this has been uh, the time flies when you talk about. I mean, I listened to this uh, to variations of this speech uh, several times, uh, but I don't seem to get enough of it. <laughs> so thank you. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> On contrary. Um, so. I, I guess I, I want to uh, link to what you were saying about uh, the essential work and, and how much do we value it. Our, our previous speaker, Lynn Segal, spoke about the politics of care and how uh, care workers responsible for performing the kind of work that reproduces our societies are being increasingly devalued, humiliated, and you yourself mentioned uh, the proposed 1% raise for, for nurse, which is uh, which was frankly insulting. So there is essentially exploited. So such invalu invaluable work is nowadays uh, rendered almost worthless. Um, it seems that people's uh, love for others, you know, people's love for other human uh, beings and the environment has been manipulated and rewired somehow, uh, you know, as love for work per se. So can you tell us a bit more about how this process took place in, in your view? Have we made ourselves complicit in our own demise somehow? I think it's, I always want to steer away from sort of arguments about self-exploitation. And I mean, because self-exploitation is just not possible. Like exploitation is when your employer is keeping more of the value than you are producing or that you are producing than they are paying you. So you literally can't self-exploit. It doesn't work that way. That doesn't make sense. Um, and in terms of, of how these desires sort of get twisted and turned around, um, I think that this is part of how capitalism changes, right? That like I, I, you know, to go back to like Marx, um, struggle is what shapes our history. And so people kicked against a certain kind of capitalist work, which was frankly sort of miserable the whole time, it was more or less miserable. Um, I'm reading Joshua Freeman's book, Behemoth, right now, which is a history of the factory. And it's really interesting as he sort of moves from the factories in Manchester to the factories in Massachusetts um, that were not at for or for quite a while using steam power. And so there was not at least coal dust. And that actually supposedly made a difference in the lives of the, the workers there. But still, you know, working in a mill still sucked, right? Um, and so people protest that. And this, you know, I'm particularly interested in like the story of um, Lordstown, which I've been to. I went to report on it when it closed finally in 2019. I met workers who had worked there the entire time the factory was open. It opened in 1966. This was a place that was sort of this high tech, new, exciting General Motors factory that was opening as the steel mills are closing, as like the area, um, Lordstown is right outside of Youngstown, Ohio, which was a big steel town. Um, so as the, the sort of crisis is happening, this factory is opening up and this factory is supposed to be um, exciting and innovative and more automated. And what that really meant, of course, was just the speed up, right? It was just that you had to, at one point, they had um, 100 cars going down the line an hour. Imagine having to like you know, whatever part of the assembly you're doing, whatever like, you know, bolt gun you're lifting a hundred times an hour, um, ow, <laughs> like for, you know, nine, 10 hours a day. So the workers protest this, but they, they protest this in a way that is also like, yeah, we're protesting the speed up, but also this entire way of living kind of sucks and we don't want to spend 40 years doing it. And that is sort of what we're being sold what's being sold back to us when you know uber says be your own boss 
is like, oh, you have some freedom. You're not like trapped on the assembly line all day. So your your situation is better than those guys. But the thing is that, you know, they got to the point of protesting the entire existence of the thing when they had a union, they had a good contract, they made pretty good money, they could buy a house in Lordstown, send their kids to college so their kids didn't have to work in the factory. Um, so the security gets sort of yanked away and what we get offered instead is, ooh, isn't it exciting? It's flexible, right? I'm a freelancer. I'm, I'm literally the poster child for this, right? I don't particularly want a job, but also there aren't jobs on offer anyway. You know, the media is dying. I don't have an offer for like a good full time job that would actually, you know, pay me a decent salary and, and in the US pay my health insurance. Um, those are a, a shrinking, disappearing commodity. So what's my choice? My choice is to hustle or find a different industry also, which are dying. I mean, yeah, my, my other options are like, oh, I'm going to go into academia. Oh, whoops. That's not happening. Um, what else could I do? I could go work for a labor union. Oh, those are dying too. <laughs> it's tough, right? So, so what happens is this affirmation trap, right? That like you have to work so hard just to get a job, just to get to something that's halfway decent, that this like gratitude for that is just imposed on us, right? Um, I worked for a somewhat notorious sexual harasser who was finally outed a few years ago, um, years after I had worked there, although everybody who had worked for him was involved in finally sort of outing him when Me Too happened and people actually finally cared about such things. And this was a progressive media outlet, supposedly. And so I, I was at a conference a few weeks after this happened and somebody who was a, you know, longtime organizer was kind of like, yeah, but aren't you like grateful to him for giving you a job? And I was like, no, I'm good at my job. Why should I be grateful to him? Right? Especially because he was a creep. But even if he's not a creep, like I don't need to roll around in gratitude for somebody giving me a job. I do my job. I do my job rather well. And that's it, or it should be it. Yeah, um, I totally get that. I, I, even when I was, uh, you know, undergrad, uh, I think that's where this fashion of freelance uh, job and gaining your kind of freedom um, was in, in, in full kind of, of power. And I lapped it up, I have to say. I lapped it up, you know, I, I thought that I'm buying my own freedom, but actually kind of I entrapped myself into precarious existence for a while you know at very young age as well um, so I, I hear you and uh, you know those horrible stories uh, like the one that happened to you and I'm sorry that it, it did uh, with that horrible sexual harasser um, yeah it, it, it was there was an understanding that uh, you know you have to put up with uh, some dose of harassment like we would go into work thinking like okay there is a degree we, you know you're going to be harassed it's just there's like a ceiling uh, mm. for yeah. all of us like yeah. oh i know that i will have to just put up with it yeah. um we received um a, a very good question from from a wine saying hi Sarah there are some hot workplace disputes underway in the UK at the moment uh, uh, from refuse workers and cleaners mm -hmm. the latest flashpoint is the Thurrock Council where the refuse collectors are threatening strike action after the local council tried to impose a pay cut after clapping for key workers of course during the pandemic and bearing in mind refuse workers have been hammered by Covid is there something of a challenge here, do you think, about how people in power and society in general value or not workers who deal with our waste? Is there a love reproduction angle uh, here? But and he shared the link if you want to, uh, you know, learn about it more later. I mean, I love a good garbage worker strike, I must say, because there is nothing you will notice faster than your trash not being picked up. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's really interesting, and I talked to a few um, waste management employees, um, various like both private and public refuse workers in the US during the early days of the pandemic. I just, my colleague Michelle Chen and I just did a series of, of talking to people about work. 
and right, the variety of, of ways that they were exposed to the virus um, was just horrifying. And the interesting thing about that, um, this is a th thing that's burned into my brain because of course in the US we're constantly talked about how, you know, how dangerous it is to be a police officer and actually it's much more dangerous to be a trash collector among other things than it is to be a police officer. Um, and there is a thing that is not, nope, very few people would expect you to love your job picking up garbage. However, there's a, a long sort of history of expecting certain kinds of people to do jobs that are associated with dirt. And this is connected also to caring work, right? That um, home care work, that the intimate labor of nursing, people who are responsible for cleaning are often treated as though they are dirty. And this has a, a long history that I find sort of fascinating and infuriating because this is incredibly necessary work. And um, yeah, so I write about this a lot actually in the, the chapter in the book on paid domestic labor because there is a way that, you know, we sort of want to outsource the dirty work to people that then we don't want to look at or see or acknowledge because then we would have to acknowledge that, you know, as a society we produce a lot of garbage and it's somebody's job to take that garbage away so that we don't have to look at it. And that those people are often treated horribly in the workplace and that it's a dirty, that it's a dirty job is something that we should respect and pay and provide safety equipment. This was a huge complaint of, of the workers that I spoke to. We're not getting, you know, increased safety equipment. I mean, they already weren't getting enough of it just to do the job on a normal day without an incredibly transmissible, you know, new, disease spreading. So um, yeah, I think the the lesson that I take from this is always that like we assume that certain kinds of people are naturally predisposed to certain kinds of work and that has an effect on how we think of the value of those people, which is a really awful way to think about people. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and speaking of dirty work, um, manipulating our emotional attachments in service of uh, capital is not a novel trick, right? Um, ever since women were forced out of predominantly pre pre uh, productive to predominantly reproductive uh, labor relations, so from uh, waged workplaces to homes, we have fought not only to make it back to the labor market and attain equality there, but to make the work that we do at home, the dirty work, uh, visible, and uh, we are still mostly failing. So even when we share it with our kind of partners, the work itself uh, remains invisible and still performs the same function, right? It props the the system that we people who sell our labor uh, to survive do not benefit from as much as others do. So on the one hand, uh, as you said, we are supposed to love our job in order to get employed and to earn wages. So it's not enough any longer to simply be skilled at doing something. You know, you have to be passionate about it. About it. Um, you know, and on the other hand, the work enveloped in love, uh, you know, and uh, such as reproductive labor does not somehow deserve to be remunerated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right. you know, in productive labor, we seem to cherish love, uh, you know, cherish this connection between love and work and in reproductive labor, we do not. So in your view, should labors of love be rewarded more? Or should we perhaps try to dispense with the category of love entirely in relation to work, be it reproductive or productive? Yeah. Yeah, I am a big fan of the latter idea because the thing that happens when we are expected to love our jobs is that we are expected to treat that love as though it is payment. And so you teachers, how dare you ask for a raise? Don't you love the kids? Well, loving the kids is supposed to be your reward for teaching, never mind how much more difficult and annoying the job has gotten over the years as the class sizes get bigger, the testing requirements get more onerous, the amount of paperwork you have to do is more intense, and everybody is on the internet now. So um, that, right, that idea that like, how dare you ask for more, isn't this a good job, right? That actually serves to drive down wages and drive down conditions. So, you know, don't you love the job? Don't you want to stay another four hours today? Um, don't you love the job? I mean, I did this 
did this the other day. I had an editor get back to me at eight o'clock at night and say, oh my God, can you get these edits back to us tonight? We're finally, we're going to squeak this into the print publication. And I was like, well, damn, I do want it to get in the print publication. Um, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do edits for two hours at eight o'clock at night because that's what happens. Um, and yeah, and, and then you go, oh, damn it. I just did it. I, I literally after that, I sort of tweeted about it and I was like, somebody smacked me upside the head with a copy of my own book. <laughs> but of course, the problem is it's not an individual problem, right? That this is not like. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if you love your job or not. What we actually have to do is value the work that actually needs doing in society commensurate with its value, right? Like to talk about essential work is to say that we have, there is work that needs to be done in order for us to exist as a society. Sorry, Margaret Thatcher, we live in a society. And to, to start there, right? There's a Selma James line that I, I quote in the book that I love. It's just like the name for, for this is relationships. She's talking about society and all of these things. And what if that was the principle that our work would serve? What if we actually started from there? What do we need done to make sure society functions? Well, we damn sure need the guys to pick up the garbage and the women, it's not just guys. Um, we definitely need the garbage picked up, right? We definitely need food. We need care. We need health care. We need transportation, right? What are the things that actually need to get done? Starting from there, what would the world look like if we actually prioritize things that way? And, you know, I was talking to, I'm working on a couple of stories about tech workers right now. And I was talking to Corey Kreider from Fox Club, which is a, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a legal organization that works on tech in a variety of ways. And one of the things that they've been doing is working with content moderators who are in many cases, you know, outsourced workers who are working for companies like Facebook making sure that all of the awful garbage that people post on the internet doesn't make it through to your feed. So these are people who just their day, their day in day out job is to look at the worst garbage on the internet. That sucks. Having had Tucker Carlson um, share my information on his TV show, I can tell you about the worst garbage that ends up on the internet. Um, content moderators are wonderful. And the point that she made that I thought was really great was that you know Facebook treats this work as if it's not part of their core operations. It's outsourced, it's underpaid, it's being done by migrant workers in a lot of cases who are easier to exploit. And what if Facebook actually had to pay these people properly and give them proper support so that they're not being horribly traumatized by this work and getting like just the worst like self-care tips in order to solve it. What would Facebook look like if it actually had to pay for that work? Maybe it would look totally different and maybe it would suck a lot less, right? What, you know, we, we jokingly refer to Twitter as this hell site. What would these places look like if you actually had to value the labor of making them less miserable? Oh gosh, yeah. Um, there is an undercurrent of, of invisible workforce everywhere uh, you know, around the world, uh, you know, and I'm talking about immigrant workforce that you touched upon. Um, but yeah, I, I have a feeling that we are a long way away from uh, kind of transforming workplaces to that degree where even the most marginalized will be visible and, and would enjoy security, you know, and and um, normal life because we don't even treat the very the most visible work as well so joe bruce uh, uh, mentioned uh, teachers you know yeah. touching up, up upon what, what you've said about teachers and at the moment uh, in the uk we are not vaccinating them uh, you know uh, we're forcing them to work with kids um, yeah. But uh, yeah, they're not prioritized for the vaccine, but instead uh, given these lateral flow tests on a regular basis. So do you have a comment uh, on, on that? Yeah, um, there were reasons why like 16,000 people joined the NEU on a weekend, right? During one of many moments when the government was just going to keep schools open, even though, you know, case numbers were skyrocketing. Um, the Chicago teachers here in New York, or here in Chicago in the US, um, were 
are today um, having basically a showdown with the mayor because the caseloads are up in Chicago because they reopened all the bars and shockingly, don't know where the case numbers came from, huh? Um, and so the teachers are saying, no, we're not gonna teach in person anymore because this is a death trap. Um, and so we'll see what happens. They may be on strike from tomorrow um, because that's, you know, that this is whatever. Um, in New York, I wrote about this last spring, the mayor, we have so many terrible mayors in, in the US. Um, it's just, it's special. So the mayor of New York, who is soon to be term limited out, thank God, um, was going to keep the schools open as of course, New York was the first, you know, epicenter of the virus in, in the US. And the teachers organized a sick out and forced the schools closed. That was the first round. And this has been an ongoing fight, you know, all year. LA, where I mentioned I covered the big strike, they were the first ones to get a side letter added to their union contract saying that they got a say in when the schools were reopened and having some, you know, um, say on those conditions. So, I mean, yeah, like the, the short version of all of what I just said is that like the answer has to be organizing in these workplaces and being willing to say like, no, we're not going to die for this. And we have teachers have been like the, the most militant part of the US labor movement for the last decade, um, absolutely followed shortly by nurses, actually. So um, and there are reasons for that, right? Like I, when I was talking about the affirmation trap um, last year, 2019, actually, I guess um, there was a strike among GM workers. One of their demands was try to reopen the Lordstown plant, among other things. Um, they didn't succeed. And then the Chicago teachers went on another strike shortly thereafter. Um, in early 2020, actually, and or no, 2019. What is time this year? Anyway, shortly thereafter, the Chicago teachers went on strike again, and they won many of their demands, including things that the city had said they can't bargain over, like extra funding for homeless students. So, you know, the reality is that that factory workers have a lot less power right now when the boss pretty much wants to shut the factory down and move it somewhere cheaper anyway. But teachers and nurses are in your neighborhood. And as I mentioned, the garbage workers, hey, oh, yeah, they have a lot of leverage because, again, how long do you think it's going to take everybody's angrily calling the council when their garbage hasn't been picked up in three days, a week, two weeks? That's fun. So public sector workers actually have a lot of leverage now that we maybe don't think about. But again, I, I love a good garbage strike. I'm saying, super here. <laughs> what I, if any of them want to talk to me? I would love to cover a good garbage strike. Um, really into it. It's such a just like yeah. You think this is an important work? Live without us. I dare you. Um. I'm sure you you will have plenty of opportunities to do that because they are striking. So, um, <laughs> um, Emma uh, um, raised a, a good question, and um, it I, and it, it kind of resonates partially to something that I've been thinking about. Uh, so I'm going to ask maybe two part question. You know, with all this resurgent interest in work, we rarely refer to ourselves as workers anymore you know it is almost treated as a bad word uh, uh, and instead we are referring to one another as employees as practitioners as freelancers you know as if somehow attempted to equalize this relationship between us and and uh, e employers through the language we use so how come we became so alienated from this word worker and essentially the identity of being a, a worker and emma said uh, do you think that an issue with the left is all of us defining ourselves as workers? See, I mean, it, it kind of flags that um, issue of worker being treated as a bad word um, mm -hmm. when work is the very means of our oppression. So how come we be became so alienated from this identity of a worker? For, let's start from there. Yeah, I mean, you crush the labor movement and people have a harder time calling themselves workers, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, this is this is intimately connected with all of these processes that we're talking about. So um, some of it is direct, like Walmart, right, famously refers to its workers as associates. And the idea behind that, and I don't know if it works, but Walmart was very, very good at getting its workers to identify with the company. And, you know, one of the ways they did that 
was by changing the name of what they called them. I, I don't know why associate is supposed to make you feel more part of the company than worker, but I'm a communist, so what do I know? Um, but like, the um, be your own boss shtick, right? Oh, well, you're not a worker anyway. We're actually seeing this in the US. It's really interesting um, and depressing, like the fight over Uber, right? Um, so in California, they briefly passed a law that um, changed the essentially the legal calculus about who was a freelancer, who could be an independent contractor, and who was in fact an employee. And one of the ways that they have tried to destroy that, and or they successfully did destroy that, and then are looking to defeat the PRO Act, which is the Protecting the Right to Organize Act that the Biden administration has put forward, um, that would overhaul American labor law completely to actually, you know, be at least sort of favorable to workers for once. Um, is they're organizing freelancers to be like, oh my God, this is terrible because we're freelancers and we whatever, and it's freelancers against the Pro Act. And like, a they're just they're just factually wrong about what it would do. Um, I'm I'm a labor journalist and a freelancer, and I think it would be great. Um, but also, it's that that very thing, right? Of of it's mostly sort of upper middle class freelancers who are legitimately independent contractors, right? But who are totally willing to nuke a law for absolutely everyone because it might make their billing practices a little bit more complicated. P.S. It actually wouldn't um, because that's not what it does. But, but anyway, so like this whole thing has a, a long history. The example I always use is the port trucking industry. Um, I'm actually reading the, the Mark Levinson's book, The Box, about the container ship right now. So I'm, I'm freshly thinking about the ports also. But um, so the port truck drivers are the drivers who sort of take the container when it comes off the, the ship and to the nearest place where it then gets unpacked. Um, and this is was, at least at one point in time, a unionized industry that was controlled by the Teamsters, which were a notoriously corrupt and racist union, um, which is also a thing that the labor movement has to answer for. And one reason why some people don't want to maybe associate themselves with it. Um, and so as people are trying to get access to these jobs, which were at the time good jobs, they're trying to break into access to this, you know, through the union. And what ends up happening, because it's 1981 or so, is that they end up deregulating the entire industry by an act of Congress, actually deregulates the entire industry. So what you get is Uber before Uber. So now the truck drivers own their own trucks or lease them directly from the company. They are paying for everything themselves, but they also still work for the company. They can't actually just do it when they want to. It's not even like an app that you can turn on when you want to and turn off when you want to. Um, and they get paid like terribly. So, I mean, you'll be surprised to know that now the industries are totally dominated by people of color and the conditions are terrible. So um, this is how capital is very good at taking the demands of workers for something good and going like, eh, we'll give it to you, but we'll screw you over while we're doing it. Um, and yeah, so now they're they're not workers. They're independent contractors. They're still workers. They're definitely misclassified and a bunch of them have won lawsuits about this actually, although the industry still sort of continues to exist in this way. And it's all been a process of sort of hacking away at solidarity, which like, you know, one of the definitions people use of neoliberalism is a political project of destroying solidarity. And I think if we think of it that way, you can find all of these different ways that this project of cohesion, which is not like an identity as worker that's important, but it's an idea that what's best for me is when all working people are doing better. So I support the PRO Act. It actually won't make anything harder for me as a freelancer, but even if it might make certain things a little bit harder for me as a freelancer, as a whole, you actually have to understand it not as like, what is my identity, but like, what am I part of? And that's the thing that they actually really wanted to destroy, not just whether we identify as workers or not. Yeah, and we uh, we get a lot uh, uh, of that uh, kind of aim to this distract uh, from our politicians. So recently, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has stated that people had enough time off and that they need to go back to work as if being yeah furloughed, uh, made redundant or make made to work at home. Um, 
you know a holiday for people of, of sorts so um yeah that the, there is that narrative going on so so many of uh people in the chat pane um not surprisingly because we are at the, uh, at the university um uh, were you know raising questions about how academics can organize especially in light of the very recent issue at the open university um, that several people mentioned the open university has recently announced announced it will delay our long promised permanent contracts for um, for our tutors uh, or ALs as, as we call them associate lecturers mm -hmm. um, and those are the people people who uh, work most closely with our students, so similarly to teachers. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit more how, uh, you know, uh, as Naomi uh, asked, uh, you know, how more securely employed colleagues uh, can support more precarious or casualized colleagues and what we can do uh, in academia, in your view, um, to kind of overturn this increased mm -hmm. Uh, precarization, casualization of of, yeah. late, of workers. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the more militant unions you've got in the UK is the UCU. Absolutely right. I've been following a whole bunch of these uh, actions and and uh, visited a few uh, picket lines when I was in London the last time. Um, so made some made some friends and uh, influenced hopefully influence some people. I actually just had Joe Grady on my podcast a few weeks ago, um, talking about some of this right and like the casualization. Um, it's exactly that idea of destroying solidarity, right? That like if you casualize some people, but not everybody, then the people who still have it pretty good will not be invested in fighting for the people who are getting the short end of the stick at the bottom, especially if, and this is a point that like several adjuncts made to me when I was talking to people about this, um, if the adjuncts are doing the part of the job that other people don't really wanna do anyway, they're really invested in sort of quietly keeping things the way they are. So um, the folks at Rutgers University over here in the States actually just won a landmark contract around this because at the very beginning of the pandemic, they started this fight, so it's been over a year, um, but they actually got all of the unions together. So the union that represents the tenured faculty and tenure track faculty, the union that represents the adjuncts, the union that represents like university staff, so administrative staff, all of those people, and even um, and sort of building services workers and all of that. So all of these unions formed a coalition to actually say, and the, the tenured and tenure track faculty said, we'll take a cut. Take it from us rather than laying people off. We'll take a percentage cut because we make enough money. We can do that. And it's been a long fight, and I actually don't know all the details of what's shaken out because the last three months I've been very busy, but I was literally just before this emailing uh, one of the professors over there, Todd Wolfson, who some of you might be familiar with, to say, who's the, the president of the union, to be like, so you want to come on my podcast and tell me how you did it? Because, um, yeah, it was, it was absolutely essential that they realized this sort of right up front and said they're going to come for the people who are easiest to take this from. And that's not just, again, not just precarious faculty, but also building services workers who are going to be the people who are sort of forced in in person, all of these things. Um, and we need to actually be willing to say, we'll do something, we'll take risks, and we will make sacrifices if we need to, to make sure that everybody gets protected here and we actually have solidarity across the university. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sarah. Uh Trade unions uh, are seeing a period of revival in many places, but they are still not as mainstreamed, perhaps, as they used to be some decades ago. And uh, moreover, we rarely see a representative from a trade union being invited to voice the opinion of workers, um, you know, on news or on political shows. Yet representatives from uh, business, government, supranational super uh, organizations are routinely invited to have a say about the important socio-political, economic, environmental events and developments. Some countries like the country uh, of my birth, Montenegro, do not even have uh, legitimate trade unions um, or have unions that proactively work against those they, they uh, claim to represent. So infamously, yeah. recently, we had, uh, uh, you know, our representative from from a pensioners union uh, protesting against the government's proposal to increase pensions which are 
kind of already below the living standard. Um, and it, meanwhile, you know, also, uh, as we touched upon before this uh, uh, talk, Amazon workers in Alabama just voted against unionizing what will seem like a baffling decision to so many people. So what, what is your advice on how to make trade unions matter again? Yeah, I mean, the Amazon story in Alabama is just, you know, it's heartbreaking, but it's also really important to understand that like in the US, the labor, this is why I've been talking about the PRO Act, right? Labor law is so stacked in the employer's favor that it's just absolutely, essentially impossible to win an election like this because the employer can just stack the deck in so many ways. I mean, in this case, Amazon did at least three things that we're pretty sure were, act, were actually illegal. But a whole bunch of what they did, like pulling employees off of the line to do captive audience meetings, um, sending them texts at all hours of the day and night, forcing employees who had um, arrest records to wear anti-union gear at work. Um, all of that's legal. They can just do that. Um, deny the union any access to the workers. They even got the stoplight outside of the factory or the, I keep saying it's a factory, it's a you know warehouse. Um, got the stoplight changed so that people were trying to talk to workers as they drove into the parking lot couldn't do it because the light was going too fast. So the amount, and it's Amazon, right? It's the, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. It's a massive surveillance enterprise that runs half the internet. Um, the fact that, that Amazon can bully a whole bunch of its workers into voting how it wants when the law is just you know, yeah, that, that most of the stuff that they did is, is totally legal. Yeah, it's it's not all that surprising, but there is worker organizing going on in a bunch of Amazon facilities. In fact, last week, as they were counting votes in Alabama, workers at an Amazon facility in Chicago just went on a self-organized strike. Um, they're organized as, as um, Amazonians United Chicagoland, and they're protesting 10-hour shifts, 10-hour overnight shifts. Um, and they've been organizing that way without an official union contract for quite a while. So, you know, the challenge right now is often um, realizing that in many ways the, the law is not your friend and we actually need to figure out new strategies and tactics that work when the law is stacked against you. So I think, you know, it's actually impressive how much organizing, striking, militancy we're seeing even in a global pandemic right now. But yeah, I mean, capital still has a lot of power and um, they they have had the levers of political power for quite a while too. And they still do in many ways, even here, even, you know, Joe Biden's been better than I expected him to be, but still like he's still got some guys who worked at Uber in his administration and Kamala Harris's brother-in-law works for Uber. So, um, you know, I still, I still worry about some of this stuff. Yeah, um, definitely. A few people from the audience pointed out to the uh, somewhat archaic structures of trade unions. So it's kind of well known that some unions still replicate the same patriarchal stereotypes oh. that divided and conquered uh, workforce of the most of the world, um, as elaborated amongst other by Silvia Federici, for example. Uh, so that women suffer inequality in all spheres of life, even in places founded on seemingly progressive uh, principles is unfortunately true. So how can trade unions, let me reformulate the first question, <laughs> how can trade unions regain trust and make themselves relevant to women's experiences of work specifically? Yeah, I, in that interview that I mentioned with Joe Grady from UCU, she was saying like, if we had to create unions from scratch right now, we wouldn't do it in the shape that they currently exist. They would look different because they, I mean, the unions that we have now were invented in that period of industrial labor for a very different workplace. And so people are reinventing the union all over the place though. And I think this is one of the things that so like, the places where it's been successful in many cases are caring workers. Um, so the teachers unions in the US, um, they call it now bargaining for the common good. And it's, as I mentioned, the Chicago teachers bringing demands to the bargaining table around extra funding for homeless students, things like that. 
um, demands that are coming from the parents and the students in the community and building trust that way, but also, you know, using the actual leverage that they have with the ability to go on strike and, and really, you know, paralyze the city. That has built a new kind of union militancy that isn't that is based in in bringing the community along with you using the power that you have to actually benefit more people. Um, the coalition that I was talking about at Rutgers, again, organizing sort of up and down the university so that you're not sort of getting, you know, one more privileged set of workers winning demands for themselves and leaving everyone else behind, like the <clears throat> old Teamsters that I discussed, um, but actually you're bringing everybody along. These are things that actually look to me like an attempt to build unions that people trust and believe in and see as a social movement that actually represents the working class as a whole and not just like a specific group of workers, which, you know, for a very long time were a specific group of white and male workers. Absolutely. Um, I love that answer. So for the generations of our grandparents and our parents, um, strikes were the most powerful tool for resistance and re renegotiation of working conditions. And especially in light of affirmation gap that you mentioned in your presentation. What do you think about, uh, you know, the strategy, that strategy? Uh, is, is this still the case or do people need to rethink modes of resistance to exploitations or any, any thoughts on, on potential <coughs> alternatives on how to make strike action more impactful, for example? I'm just going to go back to the garbage strike. <laughs> um, the way that um, we do have to understand like where where the leverage is, right? So teachers going on strike, they are powerful precisely because it's a as we've noticed this year, because you know teachers aren't in the schools, it's a real pain in everybody's ass when the teachers aren't there because then the kids are home. Then everybody else who has to go to work is dependent is dealing with the fact that the kids are at home. And all of these problems uh, pile up very quickly. So you want the schools open. Um, but also teachers are powerful, as I was saying, because they're connected to so much of the community. So it's not, it doesn't just work to sort of walk out and be like, screw everyone. Again, um, unions tried that. There's some history about that in my book. Um, didn't work so well. What actually has worked is building those relationships and that power again um, within the community so that when you walk out, you know that people are there with you. And even then, right, like the GM workers, you know, it's not that people didn't support them. It's just that going on strike when the boss already wants you to stop working is has limited utility. So yeah, what do we do in those situations? Um, where is the place that you can have power when the thing is already being shut down? And that requires, it requires an understanding of the, the affirmation trap as a problem, right? And, and to say like, okay, if this is what they want us doing, essentially begging for our jobs, what if we stop? How do we think about stopping? How do we think about leverage that lets us stop? And that that's the challenge, right? What is the thing that we demand? What is the thing politically that we build that uses the power of people who still have that leverage, right? What, what kind of solidarity are we building with the garbage workers so that when the garbage workers start, stop working? Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I. No. So, mm, also, like Martin Luther King was on the picket line with sanitation workers in Memphis when he was assassinated. Like it's, it's got it's got some yeah. political resonance in this country too. But um, so yeah, general how strike how then. Think about, but how do we think about this as as like political power, political demands? Again, that question of essential work, right? Like I, I this moment has given us a language to talk about this in such a way that like reminds us like okay what's what's going to be missed where does leverage exist and what are the other things that are are gonna you know bring power um you know in joshua's book he's talking about bringing back the riot which is certainly having a comeback across the world um and 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm thinking of you know the gilet jaune and like shutting down transportation centers, right? I mean, if you uh, pick up a flaming car and dump it in a toll booth, then you're gonna screw up everybody's life, whether or not the factory is open, right? Um, there are ways, perhaps less dramatic than a flaming car and a forklift, but you know that was a good video. Um, that we actually have to sort of understand where the moments of leverage are or like you know am i going to wind up with a tribute to the big boat stuck in the suez canal i guess i am <laughs> right like this and this brings me back to the amazon workers right which is like if you actually shut down one of these amazon facilities for any extended period of time when amazon is something like 50 percent of all retail traffic now um you can screw things up real quick you know and so yeah, I mean, these are these are complicated questions that don't lend themselves oh, easily definitely. to one answer, obviously, but like it does require actually thinking about sort of what what the levers of power are and where you stick the wrench in. Yeah, um, thank you for that insightful answer to a very, very difficult question. Um, that was very kind of you. Uh, we have so many amazing questions, um, and I don't know if you are willing to answer one more quick. Sure. Kind of quick I mean, as long as everybody has, uh, you know, I don't want to hold anybody else up who has to go somewhere. Um, so Lauren Townsend, hi Lauren, uh, says, is there a connection to be made between being asked to love your job and the way employers increasingly adopt surveillance of workers? It's almost like some of the controlling and toxic behavior many people unfortunately go through in intimate relationships, perhaps. So your comment on that. Yeah, comment, I, Sarah. yeah no, I've, I've been thinking about this because of Amazon, right? Because Amazon is just a notoriously awful place to work. Like even the white collar jobs are, are just grueling and awful by all reports that I've read, right? So, and yet like Amazon had these people on Twitter who apparently are like actual fulfillment center workers who are paid a little bit extra. We can't figure out how much, although if anybody knows, um, I, I would love to leak that, um, that are, are on Twitter being paid probably not very much extra to defend Jeff Bezos and the company from anybody, you know, including elected officials who might criticize the company. And it just struck me as like so dark, you know, like your job isn't bad enough that you're in a, you know, massive warehouse for a 10 hour overnight shift. And then you've got to get on Twitter and tell everybody your boss is awesome. And your boss isn't, <laughs> he's just demonstrably not. And he's the richest man in the world. Um, and it just, it, yeah, that's just like horrifying, right? Just like, what is wrong with this guy that he doesn't have enough that he also needs to make sure that nobody can criticize him without being challenged? Like, yeah, gosh, how, so many, just, so gross. many people me mentioned uh, that emotional blackmail. Um, yeah, you know, that our employers yeah, absolutely, right? a problem. Oh, definitely. So. Um, Unfortunately, this is all the time we have left uh, in, in this session. Um, thank you so much for, for such an insightful talk, Sarah. Uh, but before we close down the session, do tell us what's next. Uh, you know, is, is it something you love and are we going to love it? What's next is a vacation. Um, I'm finishing up the art aforementioned articles about tech workers this week and then I'm taking a break. <laughs> nice. Um, that's even better answer than I anticipated. Um, so thank you everyone for very thought provoking questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them in the session. I tried to group them uh, together to make sense out of it, but unfortunately we ran, ran out of time. Um, but to those whose questions Sarah did not get to answer here, she, she will try do her best to consider them in the coming days and send you her responses. For those interested in purchasing Sarah's wonderful book, you can get 25% off using the code WORKLOVE25 in capital letters. That's WORKLOVE25 at checkout where you buy, uh, when you buy from the publisher websites, uh, which is Hearst Publishers. 
Our next event is taking place on 17th of May. May. Uh, join us for the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, where our own uh, Open University academics, Matthew Jones and Sersha Oshia, will discuss the experiences of uh, LGBT plus police officers and prisoners from their own research. Um, and finally, uh, please stay tuned for all upcoming GOP events and uh, you know, those from our Academic Center of Excellence Reef on the Business School Twitter account. And we hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye.